Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I'd like to do another segment of Ask the Nick. So the response to these has been great, and so I'm just going to go through some more questions, although I got more than I can answer today. So let's just go on ahead and jump into it. So Nathan Simon asks, Apple or Android? Well, unfortunately, the answer right now is Apple. Um, I did go Android for about two years, hoping for increased freedom, but the thing is, modern Android phones are getting less free every day. Bootloaders are locked. It's harder to get software updates. I mean, basically the difference between the two in terms of that is disappearing on a regular basis. And in my experience with those two years, the Android phones were not very reliable. I mean, they worked fine for checking my email, but they were crappy for doing things like, I don't know, making phone calls. And so I was very much happier when I went back to Apple. That said, there's a lot of ugly there and somebody needs to disrupt the crap out of that market right now and do something better than both. But uh, for now, I think I'm Apple. Sorry about that. Speaking of tech, Grunick asks, Hey Nick, have you ever looked into a Lenovo ThinkPad for your laptop needs? I mentioned some time back that I was hoping for a better laptop than the Apple MacBook Pros that runs Linux and whatnot. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, yeah, I thought about the ThinkPads a lot, and they were great when IBM was making them. But now that they're made by Lenovo... I've heard really bad things, that the quality control is bad, and let's face it, Lenovo as security is really dangerous. They install malware on their Windows site, and I'd be wiping that anyways, but still, that's ugly. I don't want to support that. So, uh, you know, if somebody was making circa, you know, 2005 IBM ThinkPads with modern specs, I would be all over that. But unfortunately, at the moment, all we got is Lenovo, and that's some quality ugly. But thanks for asking that, Grunick. If you know of a better way to get a compact, really powerful sort of laptop in like the 15-inch range that's well-made and can take a beating, please let me know in the comments. I'm interested. Skyknifer noticed that I uh, wear the glasses in a prior video and asked, Hey, Nick, have you ever thought about laser eye surgery? Yeah, I actually did a lot of research on it and uh, it came pretty close to doing the consult and everything. But the thing is, I don't hate wearing glasses all that much. And I do hate the thought of losing my eyesight altogether due to a complication. So given that it would be like five or six grand to get it done right, and there is a risk that my vision would get worse rather than better, I decided not to roll the dice. I'm not a terribly risk-tolerant person, so I don't know. Maybe I'll regret that someday, but for the moment, five grand buys a whole lot of glasses and contact lenses when I need them. So uh, that, that's kind of where I land on that, Sky Knife. But good question. Buddy Ian over at Tekken Tools says, not really a question, but more of a review request. Magizmo Haiku. I hope your network can give you a loaner. Yeah, I do too. Um, that's It's a high-end light, very high-end flashlight, and it's supposed to be really great. Um, it's probably not something I'd do for myself. I'm a little skeptical of uh, small batch electronic goods because I work in a field where there's a lot of that, like signal processing boxes, and very often those can be pretty crappy. So for me... I'd probably lean more towards production where more of the bugs can be angled out. By the way, this little guy is a Jetbeam RRT1 with some modifications, and oh my god, is this a joy. I just wait for the review on this guy. Oh man, do I love this light. But anyways, yeah, and I'm, I'm really hoping I can pick up a, a Haiku one of these days, and uh, if you want to make that happen, just shoot me an email. So Jeremy Goldberg asks, what's your background? I think you said you were Russian? No, Jeremy, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not Russian, except sometimes at the start of Shirogorov reviews. I should still get that looked at. Uh, anyways, I, uh, I'm i just kind of a mutt, honestly, from uh, of European descent. I know I got some English in there, I know I got some French and a little bit of German, but by and large, I'm just that guy at the back of the pound that nobody knows quite what the heck's going on, but there's probably a basset hound involved at some point in time. Uh, not terribly interesting there. And, uh, you know, I'm from the uh, the middle part of the U.S., but I got my, uh, my dad was from New York originally, and my mom's from Boston, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, there you go. Sorry, I wish that was more interesting, but unfortunately, I'm just boring like that. Knife Dex asks, what's your favorite Woody Allen movie, Nick? Well, uh, honestly, I've never actually seen a Woody Allen movie that I know of. Um, it's, I got no problem with the, the, the style or anything, but it's just never happened. And honestly, given all the ugly that Woody Allen's got going on, ranging from creepy to downright horrible, I just don't feel the need to seek it out. Um, and to answer another common question, no, I am not related to Woody Allen in any way. Sorry to disappoint there. So, good question, though. 
Oh, uh, Hilaj Neorbanea, sorry if I just butchered that, um, asks, can you maintain an IKBS knife without taking it apart ever? I can't trust myself not to lose 50% of the balls. Well, Gilad, uh, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up. I think you can do it. IKBS, for those of you unfamiliar, is Icoma Court Bearing System, and it just means that all of the balls are loose inside of the pivot here, uh, held in mostly by grease and then pressure. They take a little bit of respect to take apart. You want to make sure that you know what you're doing going into it, but it's not all that hard in the grand scheme of things. So if you have the right tools ahead of time, you can do it. Um, I've got a video up of the Boca Quake in this assembly, which shows that, and then soon you're going to see a video of this Todd Begg Steelcraft, which shows another IKBS disassembly. There are ways to get it done without losing anything. But even in a worst-case scenario, you're in the middle of working on it, and your dog knocks the table over, and bam, there go your balls, um, you can always email the manufacturer uh, and just say, you know, hey, I, I lost my balls. you got to help me out here, given that takes balls to do. Uh, uh, okay, I tried. But anyways, you can always do that, and you can even buy the balls in bulk if you go online and see what size, for instance, the Boca Quaken needs. And then you can replace IKBS that go missing for the rest of your life. So don't be too afraid to do it. It's, it's your tool, and there are always ways around it. Um, the other thing that you can always do is treat it like a sealed system. Um, meaning that if you decide, no, I'm just never going to take apart an IKBS knife, then you just use it. You carry it every damn day, and you use it, and you use it, and you use it. You might want to avoid things like sand, which can really mess with things. And then once you realize, you know what, the action is really getting bad, you send it off, either back to the manufacturer or to some random jackass who services IKBS, and you'll get it back like new. Um, cleaning it without doing a full service is a little suspect and isn't going to work so well. So I would go either one of those routes, either do it yourself, and I highly recommend that, or just treat it as a sealed system until you send it off to somebody else. So there you go. But don't be afraid of IKBS. They're just a bunch of little balls, and you got big brass ones, so you can go ahead and handle this one. At least I'm assuming. Okay, so Sjord Stuck, I'm so sorry for whatever I just did to your name, asks, Hey Nick, how do you feel about knife trends? We've seen the carbon fiber hype, titanium flippers. Do you feel yourself drawn towards the trends or the opposite? What do you think's the new hype this year? Well, that's a good question. I tend to think of these trends as kind of going in two directions. There's the fashion and there's the function. Some trends are only around because they're fashionable, and some trends pop up because somebody found a better solution, and so everyone starts using it. I mean, fashion trends are definitely out there. These are changing tastes, usually not that relevant to function. Right now, there's a strong tactical trend going on in the knife world, um, although it's, I think it's fading a little bit. Even ZT, who was kind of at the forefront, is starting to back away a little bit from the tactical and consider these to be tools and objects of art. And that's nice. Um, DLC black coatings are, you know, still very popular, and I'd say still on the rise, but that's definitely a fashion trend, and one I'm looking forward to seeing the end of. Um, right now, so Jim Skelton does knife rants every so often. He did one recently about mid-techs, and he, he complained very rightfully about stonewashed titanium slab-sided flipper frame locks. Every mid-tech maker ever right now is making stonewashed titanium slab-sided uh, flipper frame locks. It's just the case. And so that's a, a very strong fashion trend, and it's kind of annoying. Uh, he has a great take on it over there. Um, another fashion trend that's bugging me lately are the huge knives. Um, you know, I like smaller knives. This guy is much more in my size range. This is the Shirogorov Neon or the Spydeco Delica. But any decent knives these days that are being made, by and large, are huge. It's really hard to find a great, innovative new knife under three inches, and that's just the fashion right now. I'm hoping that's going to turn around. And then finally, there's the overbuilt idea. Um, you know, something, uh, this is fairly overbuilt, um, in that it's a big, beefy flip of frame lock, but it goes to an extreme with people like your Dioware or your Medford knife and tool. So those are all fashions that I could really, some of them I can take and leave, some of them I just don't like, but they don't have that huge of a functional impact on the tool. I mean, overbuilt actually can reduce the function in some cases. Um, but there are functional trends as well. There are definitely these functional trends, though, that are decided basically by people finding a better solution to a problem. Whether it's a better material, a better approach, a better mechanism, whatever. Um, you know, like carbon fiber, I think, is an example of this. Carbon fiber really is a great material. Um, you know, you can get a lot of strength 
uh, in a very lightweight package. And so in that way, carbon fiber's got a lot going for it. And it makes sense that that suddenly became fashionable because it's pretty excellent. Um, same thing with flippers. I love flipping knives. Uh, like as a flipper, it's just that's the easiest way to deploy a knife, just period, in my opinion at least. And so once people realized, holy crap, this works well, and once people figured out how to get a good detent, suddenly they exploded onto the scene. And so there are a lot of flippers being made out there. I wouldn't call that a fashion trend so much as just an advancement in the technology. There are other ways to open a knife for sure, but this is a really compelling one. So it kind of swept the world. Um, I would say same thing with titanium frame locks. I mean, the Reeve Integral Lock is the original one, but it's just the idea of using a chunk of the frame to lock the knife. Um, brilliant idea, but once it was out there, everybody started doing it, because it is brilliant, and it has a lot of strength to it, yet at the same time, well, I mean, it has a lot of simplicity. And, and so a lot of knives that I love are titanium flipper frame, lock, flipper frame locks. Good God, man. Um, and so... Yeah, it's just an advancement. Uh, lock bar inserts are another good example of this. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, you can barely see here. There's a little chunk of steel that's on the inside of the lock bar here. There we go. And it's held in by this screw, and that just prevents wear on the lock face. Beautiful idea. Once people realized, huh, we can reduce lock stick and give the lock a longer life, people started doing it. Lock bar stabilizers. Really, Rick Hinderer started this trend of including something that stops the lock bar from going too far that way. But other people have started to adopt it, um, whether it's on the interior. I mean, there are all kinds of different approaches to it, but uh, it's it's a beautiful idea. And so it swept the world and then bearings. Um, of course, there were a lot of knives out there on bearings and have been for a while now, but they're really getting popular now, especially with the flippers that really demand that kind of an action. So it's to the extent where even Chris Reeve, who is one of the most conservative sorts of people, has made a knife on bearings. Um, Chris Reeve hasn't made a flipper yet, but now that Chris Reeve himself has left, maybe that's going to change. Oh, man. He is hoping. Um, so, yeah, those are all some functional trends that are also fashionable right now in the knife world. And I don't see going anywhere anytime soon. And finally, my my future, the, the future of the knife trends. If I could predict the future, I would be far richer than this and probably, you know, I don't know, owning an island someplace. Uh, but sadly, I cannot. So I'm just going to talk about what my hopes are for the future. Titanium frame locks are really nice, but they also do have some disadvantages. Your finger has to be in the blade path. They have wear patterns that are very specific. You need, I mean, there are some issues there. And so I'd love to see more locks, uh, whether it's new mechanisms or just new working of old mechanisms. Back locks have a lot of good going on. Even like the Stan Wilson non-flipper flipper has a back lock and no one complains about that. So I, I think we need to see more of that, of button locks or things like that. Um, just, you know, we need more diversity there. I really wish the compression lock was more available to the world, um, but unfortunately, that's the joy of the patent system. Uh, so, unfortunately, one of the best locks out there is just not available for use, but there are still other good ideas out there. Um, I also hope that we get back to smaller knives. I, I do prefer a smaller knife, more along the lines of your, your Neon here, or your Spyderco Delica, um, rather than these 3.75 inch monstrosities. I mean, there's a lot of compelling knives in that big range, but we need to get back to some smaller knives on the high end for the people who live in areas where the huge ones aren't legal. So, something to keep in mind. Uh, wood and micarta need to come back as scale materials. I mean, we can stabilize them. Even the diamond wood is beautiful. We need to go back there a little bit. I think it brings a little bit more of a friendly, warm tool aesthetic for the general public. Uh, you know, if you show somebody pictures from Blade Show and they're all tactical monstrosities, people get scared. But, you know, wood, that's something like Grandad carried. And speaking of which, I think we need a modern traditional era. Well, we take all of the advances of modern knives, things like bearings, maybe things like flippers, things like, you know, really nice liner locks or back locks, and we start bringing those modern advances and modern steels, for that matter, into the traditional world. And we start creating knives that are modern and traditional all at once. Like the Benchmade Hunt line is starting to do this, or even the Chris Reeve Nandi is a great example of a modern traditional knife. And I hope there's more of that coming up soon as we kind of circle back around. I think that would be a great place to spend more time as a knife maker at this point. So anyways, um, those are my hopes for the future. And that's a great question. I hope this has been interesting. 
let's go on to the next one. The Soda Knife Guy asks, Nick, do you care where knives are made? Well, kinda, yeah. I enjoy buying American-made knives because I like rooting for my home team. I want my country to succeed, just like I'm sure the rest of you do. Um, and so I love buying an American-made Spyderco or Aziti, Chris Reeve, or even an American-made independent knife maker like John Graham here. Um, made, you know, four hours south of me. It's nice. Why not? Um, but the thing is, being an American-made knife company does not guarantee my support in any way, shape, or form. If you've got poor products or poor quality control, I'm not buying your stuff no matter where it's made. And you're not going to get away with charging better, uh, bigger prices because you're from the States for crap. I mean, there are companies in the States that are making great knives at good prices. I don't care if you're made in the U.S. of A. If it's not a good value, it's not a good value. So there you go. And also, if you're fake made in the USA, oh, man, we're, we're closed. Um, you know, Quartermaster is apparently making a lot of the knives in China. The evidence is on their Instagram feed, or at least it was before they removed it and then banned everybody. Um, so, you know, they're on my list. Or even Shinola is a watchmaking company. They're in Detroit. They claim built in Detroit. The thing is, they're taking Swiss watch movements and combining them with Chinese watch cases. And that doesn't pass my sniff test. You cannot really claim made in the U.S. of A. And the F uh, FCC just smacked them down on that. So there you go. And I guess at the end of the day, I got to remind you that quality isn't at all exclusive to the U.S. I mean, this is a Chinese-made knife that is really high quality. This is Canadian. I mean, there are great, great knives made overseas as well. So I don't really care where it comes down to. Although I'll say buying in the States does give me the occasional warm fuzzy. So there you go. Good question, Minnesota knife guy. So Nathan Simon asks a really common question. Nick, what are your thoughts on firearms? Do you carry one? Well, they're interesting mechanically, no doubt, and putting holes in paper is a lot of fun, but there's not really a passion there for me, um, in the same way that there is for knives or flashlights or watches. Um, so, and, uh, you know, in terms of whether I carry one, it's actually legal to carry one in the area I'm at, but I, I don't. And let me explain why. Uh, first off, the odds are very, very low that I would actually need a firearm. Uh, nobody hates me, nobody particularly wants me dead. Uh, I mean, maybe the maker's a Z-Hunter, but they don't live around here. Um, I live in a very boring area. There's no war. There's no real issue here. No very little violent crime. And so the odds of actually wanting to have a firearm with me on any given day are astronomically low. But the costs are very high. Um, not only in terms of equipment and whatnot, but also in terms of regular training and range time. To stay really proficient in a way that I would feel I needed to if I was going to be in that position, uh, in terms of legal insurance, in terms of complexity, legal complexity. Um, you know, can you go into this area? Is this a gun freeze? That sounds like a whole bunch of complexity I just don't need. And honestly, there are a lot of social complications too. Uh, no matter what you international folks might think, in the States, there are still a lot of people who are really uncomfortable with guns and with the idea of carrying a gun. And so, you know, that would get really tricky at times. I uh, Concealed is concealed and whatnot, but still it's not something I'd really want to mess around with. Uh, there are people in my life who I'm pretty sure if I was packing heat and they knew about it, wouldn't even talk to me. And, you know, that's just the simple fact of life. So the costs would be really high and the odds of needing it would be really low, so it just doesn't make sense. And so I manage my risk in other ways. I stay out of sketchy situations and kind of plan my life in terms of, okay, would this be a potential problem? If so, let's not do that. Um, I try to stay situationally aware, or even in boring places, because, you know, there are a lot of things that you can prevent just by not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I try to de-escalate and avoid violence wherever I can, and if I get past that, I run the hell away. And then, you know, there are times when non-lethal approaches make sense. So, you know, on the whole, it just doesn't make sense for me to carry a firearm. That said, I really don't give a damn if you do decide you want to carry, as long as you're doing it responsibly. And by that, I mean three things. First, you need a really strong commitment to avoiding violence and to de-escalating situations and doing your damnedest to make sure it stays in the holster unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, if you're going out there packing heat and looking for a fight, you're not a sheepdog, you're a wolf. You're a part of the problem. And that really bugs me. Similarly, you gotta have a level head about it. If you're carrying out of paranoia or anger or fear or just abject terror at the world, you're not gonna make great decisions and you're more likely to be a threat to the world 
than you ought to be a help to it. And that's that. And then also you got to have the training, both in terms of safety and frankly, in terms of accuracy. Um, you, you need to be a bigger threat to the bad guys than to the rest of us. And so training is kind of key. But as long as you're doing those three things, you're avoiding violence whenever you can, you got a level head about things and you're well-trained, then I really don't give a damn what's inside your waistband. Particularly if you've got an active threat, a job that comes with dangers, you're James freaking Bond, you got an abusive partner who's making threats, any of those kinds of things, I feel bad for you, but I, I'm not going to bug you at all if you're packing heat. So anyways, that's the answer. I don't carry, I don't really care if you do, but if you do, for the love of God, do your best not to need it. Anyways, I hope that was interesting for you, and um, I am, if you got any further questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments down there. I've got plenty of other, other ones, so be on the lookout for another Nick, uh, Ask the Nick segment. Hope this has been interesting, and uh, have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of your day.